Welcome to the United Four Conference organized by FEPS, the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, together with the Instituto da Fare Internazionale, CESPI, and other important foundations, Freddy Shebert, Jean Jaurès, Pablo Iglesias, and the Olof Palme Center. We are located in different cities of Europe, but we work with many other partners across the world. And these United Four conferences usually take place in New York, so let's assume that we are in New York. And the conferences are focusing on the central topic of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Two years ago it was about migration, last year it was about climate, this year is about the reform of the United Nations system, 75 years after its creation, in the aftermath of World War II, with the San Francisco United Nations Charter. Yes, the United Nations remained central to push for peace and security, human rights, development, but they also need an in-depth renewal today because we are confronted with new global challenges. Climate change, cyber security, social inequalities across the board. And now these COVID pandemics with the social and economic crisis unfolding. It is obvious that we need much stronger international cooperation. Nevertheless, we have some key players resisting to this and even undermining the United Nations system. That's one of the reasons why the upcoming American elections are so important. In front of this, we need to build up a large progressive coalition with governments, civil society actors, and citizens across the world. A large progressive coalition pushing for a new, fair and inclusive multilateralism. We can argue that the United Nations system is probably confronted to its higher test ever when it comes to the capacity to organize global solidarity in front of these pandemics. First of all, to come up with a vaccine which is launched as a global public good. Secondly, to spread universal access to healthcare and also social protection for those who need and are confronted with new risks. But this is also about saving jobs and many SMEs which are right now struggling to survive. So yes, we need to have coordinated recovery plans, a big fiscal stimulus, financed by public budgets, and also counting on much stronger action by development banks. But look, this is not only about recovery. In fact, this is about transforming, transforming our economies and societies to prepare them for this green transition, to make the best of the current digital revolution, and most of all, to step up the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. But we also know that in order to respond to new global challenges, we need to come up with fair solutions. And fairness is, first of all, about giving higher protection for those who are more exposed to the pandemic risks. It's also about providing new jobs for the workers who are losing jobs due to the green transition. 
This is also about supporting countries in need of catching up with fair trade deals. And most of all, this is about fair taxation, making sure that those who pollute, those who make financial speculation, and also the big digital platforms, which are now making extra profits, they pay their fair share of taxation. But look, this is only feasible if we have a major shift in the power balance inside the United Nations system. We need to have United Nations agencies with much stronger competences, means to be able to implement these binding objectives across the board involving all member states. We need to make sure that WTO, World Bank, IMF, they are really supporting the Sustainable Development Goals. And for this we need to involve all the relevant actors at all levels, starting with these regional organizations, which can help a lot. European Union, African Union, ASEAN, Mercosur. And above all, to increase democratic ownership with parliamentarians, with civil society in new global partnerships pushing for these new objectives. All in all, we need a global new deal. And this time, this should be a health, social and green global deal. Well, this is the purpose of this conference. And we are very pleased to launch today a policy report and a book prepared by outstanding experts together with policymakers. We are also very pleased to have a conference putting together a remarkable set of experts and politicians. Let's now open the floor and before that let's have a look to a nice video clip summarizing somehow the key ideas of this conference. What kind of world do you want to live in? One in which countries fiercely compete against each other? Or a world where countries join forces to solve our most urgent issues? The COVID-19 pandemic is a brutal reminder that our most critical challenges can only be dealt with through coordinated action. Just think how slow the search for a vaccine would be if scientists from around the world didn't collaborate and share their research. Our shared problems demand shared solutions, and to do so, we need a new, fair and inclusive multilateralism. The new multilateralism begins with the renewal of the current yet outdated UN system. This will allow us to cope together with our common challenges such as pandemics or the climate crisis. More than ever, resources must get to where they're needed most, and this requires more fully integrated financial institutions. We want a fair multilateralism that allows us to eliminate the gap between the winners and losers of globalization. For example, a COVID-19 vaccine has got to be a global asset that belongs to everyone and not a point of conflict between countries. The post-COVID economic recovery is an opportunity to build economies that reduce inequalities and implement sustainable development goals. This means a system where everyone, including digital platforms and multinational corporations, pays their fair share of taxes. Finally, this new multilateralism must be inclusive, reaching far beyond the current, mostly Western and white system, to include all voices. 
United, we have the power to build a new, fair and inclusive multilateralism. Are you in? Well, I hope you enjoyed this uh, video clip. This is a summary of our ideas guiding the conference and uh, we invite you to use it also for the campaign which will be launched uh, during the conference. Now, this is my pleasure to introduce our guest keynote speaker, Joseph Stiglitz, a very well-renowned professor of Columbia University holding Nobel Prize of Economic Sciences and also a world authority on economic uh, governance in global terms. Of course, all of us will remember several of uh, his books about these issues, but he also played an uh, important role close to the president of the General Assembly of the United Nations, chairing a committee of experts. So we are so pleased to have you now, uh, Joe, and uh, we'll pay attention to what you are coming to tell us now. Please come in and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I really do welcome this opportunity to address you in this uh, discussion on United for a New Multilateralism uh, to talk about a new, fair, and inclusive uh, uh, multilateralism. And during the talk, I'll, I'll pick up on some of the themes that the commission that you referred to that was established in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, when we were again clearly in need of global cooperation, uh, we raised a number of issues uh, in the report of that commission uh, that have not yet fully reached fruition. And never before, has the need for multilateralism and global cooperation been greater? Uh, the pandemic is the worst uh, uh, pandemic in a hundred years. The following economic downturn is clearly the worst in the last 90 years since the Great Depression, and in some ways uh, worse uh, uh, than any for over a century. At the same time, we face uh, the climate change problem. It hasn't gone away uh, every day, especially here in the United States, we're seeing more evidence of that climate change, the fires, the hurricanes, uh, the floods. Um, we have to learn how to live within our planetary boundaries and we have to have global cooperation in addressing the climate change issue. These challenges occur in an already very difficult context. Globalization has provided new opportunities for tax evasion and avoidance. And that's why uh, the emphasis in the little clip that you saw about tax justice is so important. Democracy has been under attack with technology providing new tools for surveillance, new tools for spreading misinformation and disinformation. Uh, the Enlightenment values which have guided the Western world for uh, several hundred years, uh, the emphasis on science, on truth, on uh, the basic elements of democracy, human rights, social organization uh, based on checks and balances, uh, those are all under attack. We need global cooperation to write the new rules for the digital age, to address problems of cybersecurity, privacy, misinformation. Uh, these are all problems that can only be addressed globally. But at the same time, multilateralism has been under attack, most notably from the United States. In trade, there's an undermining of the international rule of law. And just like we should have learned that no economy, no society can prosper without a rule of law, the same thing is true internationally. In health, the United States has been undermined cooperation to fight the pandemic. Uh, we've just heard again a clip about the dangers of vaccine nationalism. Uh, the 
difficulties with the, that vaccine nationalism will pose for uh, the recovery, for addressing the pandemic. Nationalism has been on the rise with authoritarian figures promoting nativism, attacking, as I said, enlightenment values. In some quarters on the edge of using new tools to move from authoritarianism to, to, to totalitarianism. I do want to sound, though, an optimistic note. The UN was founded in 1944 at the eve of victory over fascism. The pandemic may similarly be, provide a moment of opportunity. The pandemic and its economic aftermath has made clear the need for global cooperation. We won't conquer the pandemic until it's been conquered everywhere in the world. And so too for the economic aftermath. We won't have a robust economic recovery unless we have an economic recovery everywhere. The pandemic has brought home the inequities in our societies. This virus is not an equal opportunity virus. It goes after those with poor health conditions, with pre-existing conditions. And we've seen that in so many of our societies, so many of our essential workers do not have adequate health uh, uh, status. Um, and this is especially true in the United States, which has not recognized the basic human right, the right of access to health care. There's an irony here that the frontline workers, the people who are so essential to our well-being, are among the poorest paid of the workers in our society. Thus, there is a need for solidarity and inclusiveness. And around the world, the voices of those calling for that kind of solidarity have been heard very, very loudly. Costa Rica has been uh, very uh, strong in advocating at the World Health Organization the sharing of all the knowledge that is associated with addressing the pandemic. Uh, and that, and only through that global sharing of knowledge will we have a fast response. And the great news is among the scientists, there has been that sharing. But unfortunately, in some governments, including that of the United States, vaccine nationalism uh, has triumphed. And there is uh, an unwillingness uh, to engage in that kind of sharing. 30 years ago, at the end of the Cold War, we seemed to be at the dawn of a new era. Francis Fukuyama talked about the end of history, that we would all become liberal democracies, free market economies. Uh, at this point, that kind of idea seems so Pollyannish. Uh, uh, but we are at the, end, at, the, at, at the dawn of a new era. Neoliberal, neoliberalism is dead, but what will replace it is not so clear. And that's why this conference discussing a new kind of multilateralism is so important. As FEPS emphasized in a project that I headed, uh, we will need to rewrite the rules of the international game, just as we need to write the rules domestically. Uh, what is especially difficult is that we will need to cooperate to solve the problems of, of uh, climate change, for instance, or, or a pandemic or global knowledge with countries who may not share our values, who are not committed to democracies, do not concern about human rights. We should not shirk from expressing forcefully our values and taking strong actions to uh, show that we are committed to those values. But at the same time, we should not shirk from cooperating. We can think of ourselves uh, like in a rowboat. Uh, uh, we can think of a, the Titanic uh, having sunk and we're in a rowboat. Uh, we have to row to shore. We have to row to safety. Uh, we may be in that rowboat with some people that we don't really uh, 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 like uh, or whose values we don't share. But our first value is, uh, is to survive. 
And that's why we have to cooperate on climate change and on the pandemic. But at the same time, we have to be strong in our advocacy of human rights, democracy, inclusiveness, fairness. Uh, I want to conclude my brief introductory remarks by observations on six key issues. The first is international governance. And here I want to emphasize the key role of the UN. One of the recommendations the commission that I had uh, that was referred to is of the need for a global economic coordinating committee uh, going beyond the G20. Uh, such a global economic committee uh, would have greater legitimacy, more fair representation of all the countries in the world than the G20. We also emphasize that finance is too important to be left just to finance ministers. That's why the UN effort on finance for development was so important. And there are so many elements of that UN effort uh, that need, uh, still need uh, attention. The key role of international taxation, to which I referred earlier. We need to rethink investment agreements. Uh, one of the few good things to come out of this administration was uh, the rejection of uh, those investment agreements uh, and uh, taking out those investment agreement out of the uh, North America agree agreement between Mexico, Canada, and the United States. And something I'm gonna to come to in just a minute, we need better ways of handling debt restructuring. The second point is, concerns the role of international rule of law in international trade. The U.S. is walking away from that kind of international rule of law. Uh, and that has opened up a, a world of conflicts with no way of resolving them. U.S. is, for instance, refusing to honor a ruling against its tariffs on China. Uh, it wants to have it two ways. It wants to uh, have the WTO recognize uh, uh, it wants to uh, recognize the Airbus, the WTO ruling on the Airbus, uh, where it wants to use the WTO ruling in its favor, but not to recognize the, the rulings that go out of its favor. Uh, that's unacceptable. We need an international rule of law, and an essential part of an international rule of law is a system of adjudication of disputes. The international rule of law is too important to be killed by a single country or a single individual within that country. So I think the rest of the world has to go forward with my call, uh, some people call plan B, uh, a rule of law, even if the United States doesn't participate. Thirdly, international taxation. We are going to need all the money, all the resources that we have. Uh, that are available. And unfortunately, our richest corporations, our multilateral corporations, have been avoiding and evading taxes. And our richest individuals have been using tax savings. Uh, multi, uh, the, for multilateral corporate uh, taxation, we need to move away from the transfer price system to a formulaic approach, a kind of approach that's u even used within the United States. And digital taxation is going to be particularly important. Uh, the digital giants have found ways of avoiding taxes, putting at a, uh, the ordinary businesses at a disadvantage. It's unfair, lacks inclusivity, uh, needs to change. And that brings up the fourth issue, a new digital regime. Europe has led the way. There are real harms associated with unfettered uh, social media hate speech, incitement, violence, misinformation, political, manip uh, political manipulation. Uh, we've seen the dangers evident in the anti-fax movement, uh, dangers uh, as, as misinformation about the pandemic has been spread. Our democracy is at risk. These digital platforms have to be regulated and they can't be self-regulated. We've learned from the financial sector that self-regulation doesn't work. There are just too many conflicts of interest. We also know that we have to curb their monopoly power. 
Monopoly power distorts the economy and it distorts democracy. The question is who and how are the rules of the digital era to be written? They have to be written on a, based on a commitment to democracy, to human rights, not crass commercialism. The implications of this should be obvious. Fifth, we have to have solidarity with the developing countries and the emerging markets. If we do nothing, millions will die. The World Food Program has pointed out the numbers facing acute hunger will double this year from 135 million to 260 million. We have tools to address this. Many countries face a debt crisis, but we haven't done enough. The commission I referred to earlier emphasized the need for a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. The UN in 2015 overwhelmingly supported a set of principles for a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. But unfortunately, just a few countries oppose this, but they, including the United States, have blocked the development of such a bankruptcy court or a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. That needs to be a high priority. The second thing is uh, there is a tool already existent, the special drawing rights. Uh, even without going to parliaments, $500 billion could be made available uh, at no cost to the taxpayers in the developed countries. Unfortunately, the United States is again blocking this for no good reason that anybody has been able to understand. There are bills in the US Congress to go well beyond that to $2 trillion of ish new issuings of special drawing rights. This needs to be a high priority. Europe needs to take the lead in pushing this as one of the ways that we can show solidarity with the developing countries and the emerging markets. Finally, Europe is also leading the way in a green recovery. Never have governments spent so much money and citizens have the right reflecting that to make sure that that money is spent in ways that do dual purpose, that as we recover, we build back better, to use the words of uh, Vice President Biden, that we build back better with a green recovery, a no more knowledge-based recovery, a a a an economy that is fair, more inclusive, uh, more equitable. So I just want to uh, finally uh, conclude by saying, uh, we this is a moment for this new multilateralism. Uh, reflecting global solidarity. Uh, it is even in our own self-interest to pursue this kind of, of new multilateralism. In a sense, over the last year, or the last three years, we have looked into the abyss. We have seen how bad things can get. We have now a choice. What we've seen reminds us of what happened in the 1930s, an economic downturn, the growth of fascism, a world in disorder. This is a time for a new multilateralism. Uh, uh, multilateralism is fair and inclusive that helps us create the kind of world that reflects our values and our future. Thank you. Dear Joe Stiglitz, it was just great, uh, your speech. Uh, yes, you are right. Uh, the global governance rules, they need to be rewritten. And you just uh, came with a big gift for all of us, a kind of blueprint for this. I'm sure that we'll go on working together. Many thanks again. Thank you.
Good afternoon and welcome to the first uh, working session of this conference. We have a very challenging task, uh, which is made uh, even more challenging because of the time limits that we've given. And we have to explore the uh, crisis of multilateralism, its main elements. We also have to assess uh, to what extent uh, COVID-19 has accentuated the critical trends uh, which were already present in world order. But we have in particular to look at uh, initiatives, measures, decisions that could help improve global governance with a special attention on two particular points, which are the reform that uh, would be needed to improve the performance of the UN system and also to the role that regional organization could play to this end, to also the construction of a new, more effective and more inclusive multilateral. So we know already, and we know since long time, it has been repeated by the two previous speakers, that the uh, multilateralism was affected by a very a serious crisis, even before COVID. We are aware that the international rules and institutions that were presiding over the international relations and international cooperation were already contested and they, they legitimized that international cooperation and economic interdependence were not seen anymore as an asset or as values. And the factors that had led to these situations were quite well known. I'll just put them very quickly. Crisis of globalization, the absence of a hegemonic powers willing to exercise its responsibilities, the surge of nationalism and nationalistic aptitudes with a growing mistrust towards uh, international institutions and international rules. Then came COVID uh, with the three emergencies that it provoked, the health emergency, the economic emergency and the social emergency. All of them have contributed to accelerate and accentuate the crisis of multilateralism. We still have to assess uh, how and to what extent the COVID will affect the global scene. But we certainly know for sure already now that uh, the international community will have to face a deep economic recession with very serious consequences on the level of employment and on social inequalities. We know that uh, nationalistic attitudes will continue to prevail as it has been witnessed by the success of autocratic regimes. We know that international institutions uh, will continue to face criticism. Some of them have not been particularly effective in dealing with the emergency during the COVID pandemic. We know that regional crisis will remain and will continue to test our collective capabilities to provide uh, security, peace and security. And finally, we also know that strategic competitions among great powers, and in particular among the US and China, will continue to characterize the world scene in the near future, making efforts to restore an effective global governance more difficult and more complex. But on the other hand, on the other hand, COVID may also be an opportunity to rethink and to reshape uh, a new global order, a new multilateralism. For the very simple reason that we are all aware that the challenges we are facing, the international community and the world are facing, need a more effective global governance. I'm thinking in particular the need to ensure a more inclusive economic and social development. We need to uh, afford the problem of climate change. We need to be more effective in providing energy security and an effective energy transition. We need to be more effective in uh, dealing with uh, cyber security. We need to restore a free and fair international trade regime. And we need finally to manage migratory, migratory flows as well as uh, we need to reduce poverty and inequalities worldwide. So this is why this conference is concentrating on the objective of a new multilateralism for the 21st century. And I would insist on the fact that it's a new multilateralism that should deal not only with the traditional objective of uh, ensuring uh, fair economic and social development to ensure respect of fundamental freedoms and rights, 
but also to deliver on new public goods and to guarantee and ensuring a more effective governance of global interdependence. Now, to discuss all this and um, in a very short time available, we have to be, we can be on online until uh, 6 uh, 15. We have a panel of very distinguished speakers that I would like to introduce now in the order they appear in the program. The first one is Nira Tandem. She's president and CEO of the Center for American Progress, the largest uh, progressive think tank in the US. She has also been very active in the Obama administration. Hello, Nira, welcome. And we have Professor Amita Vacharia, whom I've already met during our previous proceeding. Professor Acharya teaches at the American uh, University in Washington. He teaches in particular transnational challenges and governance. And last but not least, we have Monica Hist. She teaches both in Brazil and in Argentina at the IEPS, uh, IESP University in Rio de Janeiro and at the Toquato di Tela University in Buenos Aires. My first round, uh, of, the first round of intervention that I would suggest to organize with you should be focused on what is your perception of the crisis of multilateralism? What do you see as the main elements of this crisis? But also, what sort of initiative and measures you would immediately, in, in very briefly, of course, in a very synthetic manner, indicate as possible ways and means to improve global governance and multilateralism? So you have uh, four minutes each, more or less. We have to be very strict on time of the game. I'm afraid, I'm sorry, but these are the rules of the game. Nira, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And it's a real honor to be uh, with all of you uh, as we are virtually. So uh, I, I'll try to be brief because I definitely want to get to a, a good discussion. Uh, and a lot of people have already diagnosed the problems. Uh, we've had a few speakers diagnose the problems. I would add, um, I would add an element, uh, which is to say that I think democracies themselves are facing uh, facing a crisis or an opposition from the rise of authoritarian nationalism. From you know, when you have if you look through the lens of multi nationalism, you we all recognize that uh, the rise of nationalism is a challenge. But I think we should also recognize that the rise of authoritarianism is a challenge to democracies. And uh, and these two have gone hand in hand: authoritarianism and uh, and uh, a nationalism. Obviously, I'm. I'm speaking to you from the United States. We have elections in uh, just several weeks. People are voting, beginning to vote now. So the experience of the United States is, I think, a, a critical one, which is that democracy can be undermined, as we see around the world, from within, from authoritarian impulses within, and from uh, a, a, a nationalism that uh, drives opposition to multilateralism multilateral efforts. Uh, and I think that that nationalism and authoritarianism is not and does not just arise within democracies, but obviously uh, there are external, and I would use the word threats in the United States. We are seeing again that Russia is working to interfere with our elections. The, the fact that uh, Russia is undermining uh, democracies, not just the United States, but other democracies, I think is a challenge. And the lack of discourse amongst progressive institutions around uh, uh, authoritarian threats, uh, international authoritarian threats, is, is to some degree, to me, perplexing. And I think one way, uh, I'll say something somewhat controversial here, which is that I think we continually um, focus on the existing multilateral institutions, and we should shore up the United Nations, absolutely. But I, I think we should also be candid that some of the falling away of inter support for international institutions is because that we, ha we have had crises that the UN has been incapable because of the way it's structured 
of solving. And there are myriad numbers in the, in the Middle East of examples from Syria, to, you know, examples we, that are all top of mind that, you know, the essential international order has not been sufficient. So I think it is actually give, really important to think through new multilateral institutions, new multilateral, multilateral efforts. Um, you know, at the Center for American Progress, we have thought of, of an alliances that can help address some of the challenges we see on the global stage that would uh, allow us to also act when, even when we have a Security Council that will not allow action. And I, I do think that in the world we're in, uh, multi, multilateral institutions should work against direct conflicts between countries. We should also recognize that there are countries in the world which are advocating for a form of government that is uh, oppositional to democracy. And that should not be a relatively controversial idea. And we have to think through institutions across countries of how we deal with those, those challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Nira. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. Thank you also for reminding us of the importance of the U.S. Uh, presidential elections. Uh, those <laughs> without importance sometimes to recall this. Amitav, now the floor is yours. Please. Thank you. Uh, let me start by uh, reflecting a little bit on uh, what kind of a challenge we are actually facing and how it compares with other challenges we have faced. Uh, in the recent past or since the Second World War. So, um, you know, it's a cliche to say that every crisis is unique or unprecedented, but uh, uh, in this case, it really is. Uh, let me compare COVID-19 with, uh, uh, say, climate change, which is more slow motion. And uh, yeah, you can say that uh, we see fires and floods and uh, tsunami, um, tsunamis or hurricanes, but still it is much more slow motion uh, than, uh, say, war, for example. Terrorism is not a really global threat. In fact, uh, only a handful of countries produce more than 75% of the victims of terrorist attacks and uh, victims of terrorism. So if you take out Middle East, South Asia, North Africa, it's not a really global threat. Um, World War I and World War II, of course, were global, but they were not global in the same way. Um, this pandemic has affected more countries more directly than World War I and World War II, I would uh, argue. So this is why it is creating this uh, lack of confidence and fear and anxiety about the future. And the crisis we talk about, crisis of multilateralism, is a, a crisis with a, is a C, and there are three Cs that is, uh, to me, uh, creating uh, a kind of vicious circle, mutually reinforcing, coming at the same time, and, uh, and undermining our trust in multilateralism. The first C is competition, the second is credibility, and third is confidence. The competition is basically because we have a bunch of uh, uh, great powers and uh, leaders who are not really collaborating, and particularly United States and China. Uh, and uh, you know, the kind of blame game, conspiracy theories coming from uh, even government officials against each other uh, is really not creating a lot of uh, not a very pretty sight. In fact, um, some people suggest it's like two teenagers fighting, but that would be insulting the intelligence of and maturity of teenagers. Uh, and my son is a teenager. Uh, and uh, and then the competition for vaccines uh, and uh, the fear of vaccine nationalism. So that competition is not, uh, this is a clear cause and a implication of this crisis. Uh, in terms of credibility, um, you know, there is a lot of pessimism now about multilateralism because of the competition and the lack of effective response from the UN, and you know, uh, uh, including the WHO. Maybe uh, it's a bit uh, unfair to blame WHO for everything, but I think uh, a lot more the WHO could have done, uh, and uh, also in, in the UN system could have done, and that is creating a credibility whether the UN system is geared to actually uh, address a major uh, challenge of such proportions. And the third is confidence, and the confidence in the UN, actually, uh, you know, surprisingly, the UN has been uh, quite uh, positively viewed around the world before the pandemic. Uh, in 2019, a Pew Research Center poll found that 
61% of people uh, they surveyed in 32 countries thought, uh, had a positive view of uh, the UN, and only 26 had a negative view. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we don't know. Maybe a new poll will come out pretty soon, and we'll see what the uh, pandemic's effect on uh, confidence in the UN has been. And uh, But uh, there has been some trends even before the pandemic that we should keep in mind. One is that uh, in Russia, there's a serious decline in uh, confidence in the UN, almost like a 24% decline uh, from 2007 to 2019. In the United States, it's actually very partisan. No surprises there. Uh, you know, Democrats versus Republicans. In 2019, Democrats are 41 points more likely to support than Republicans. And that gap has widened since 2013, a few years ago. So you could take this all together, the three Cs, competition, credibility, and confidence. The UN is, uh, and the multilateral system is really facing an unprecedented crisis, which cannot be compared to anything um, before. Thank you. Well, Amitav, thank you for describing in a very effective, even though synthetic manner, the impact of COVID with your three C's. I think you've been very, very straightforward and direct. Monica, now the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for having me today and in such good company. And um, I'll try not to repeat what my previous uh, colleague said. And uh, it's not very easy to bring in uh, new ideas about a such dramatic need, uh, such dramatic global um, need and which with the pandemic has become even more underlined. Uh, the first thing I would like to say is that though we're talking about the 75th anniversary, it's very important that we don't build on uh, anachronic expectations. I mean, of course, History is important and the foundation pillars and the pillars of the, of the UN system and of multilateralism as we know it today are extremely relevant. Um, Jorge Luis Borges used to say that hope is the memory of the future. And uh, something like that is what I would try to build up regarding um, the present state of multilateralism and the need for uh, revigorated and robusted uh, possibilities of its uh, uh, outcomes. Um, there is a common, and of course this is very, I mean, it's been around forever, the idea that multilateralism and the state system uh, and the states are, I mean, it, they help each other, but they, they should uh, work in a complementary way. Uh, I, I totally think that and particularly seeing uh, the void that has been created with the U.S. Um, withdrawal, with the U.S. attack on the multilateralism, that the political will of states, um, of individual states um, who stand out and who work to, the, to, to revigorate a multilateral system is very important. It, uh, though, of course, we have all kinds of communities and all kinds of academics and um, social movements, NGOs, actors, but uh, the political will of states is essential if we want to think of uh, revigorated uh, multilateralism for the 21st century. The second point is, and this is something to do, has something to do with what Professor Stiglitz said before, um, I believe in something that I would call a pragmatic idealism, um, in the sense that, of course, uh, multilateralism has always been attached to an idealistic perception of the world order. But, of course, in this case, and of course, since we're facing a very a, a critical conjuncture, we, there is a need of pragmatism. And pragmatism means working together even though there are differences and even though there will not be convergence in all worldviews that are involved. The third point I just want to make is that immediate results are needed, but also long-term, mid-term results. The UN system in particular has not always grown in a, very, in, in a positive way, in a healthy way regarding structures, regarding overlapping, regarding inefficiencies regarding the different kinds of vices, big bureaucracies, 
develop. And this has to be faced very strongly and very effectively. There have been many attempts and frustrated attempts. Uh, if this is not done with the same kind of effort in, in the political uh, uh, terrain of rebuilding and getting back credibility, as uh, Achada was saying before, on um, to work on an effective multilateralism, it will be very difficult. And of course, uh, the the vaccine, of course, the vaccine, the idea of the vaccine as uh, a public and as a public good, as a global public good, is the big chance for the UN and together with the EU to work together in an inclusive way and to put aside and to diminish the importance of what was mentioned this morning as the vaccine nationalism. This has, this is the first effort that I think that a revigorated Moody lateral system and particularly the UN should face in the very, very near future. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Uh, your remarks about the need to reform the UN uh, would lead us immediately to the second round of questions and your intervention, which uh, should actually focus on what you see as the most urgent and needed reform of the UN system if we actually want to. Uh, organize a system in such a manner where the UN can actually contribute to a better performing multilateral system. So I would start again my uh, request of intervention with Nira. Great. I, I mean, I think the uh, I, I, I should note even in my remarks, which have had had some form of criticism in them, that it is the case that the UN is seen as an important institution. And I, I would, uh, bef before I get into the reforms, note that, you know, the Trump era has uh, created uh, deep divergences on issues. So uh, even as within the United States, so in, in public opinion, so even as the United, even as uh, the Trump administration takes a, a set of actions, we see in public opinion a large scale recoil against that. So in 2016, during the election, the Paris uh, Climate Accords were, you know, had 50, 55 percent support, 40, 45 percent uh, opposition in the U.S. And then when uh, Trump exited Paris, that moved from two-thirds support uh, or around 65 percent support of the Paris Accords to roughly 30, 35 percent support of exiting. Um, and so he does actually kind of create a bit of a backlash on many issues. And I do actually believe that there is a renewed opening for both multilateralism and uh, support for UN institutions. I think the, uh, so in the elections that we're having, Joe Biden is very, is, speaks very frankly about how we, the United States should, should try again to lead the world through alliances, restore our global reputation, act with allies to solve challenges, not, you know, which range from climate to other issues, and has even talked about the importance of the U.S. leadership in a, uh, in a global vaccine, one that helps the world, not just the United States. So he's staked out really a much more multi, uh, a much, an attitude that's much more supportive of multilateral institutions and even more support of the U.N. From, you know, from my perspective, I do think a kind of central challenge um, to think through is how the, the United Nations can really solve the more intractable, intractable problems we've had with the Security Council structured as it is. And I think one of the challenges is that we have gone through uh, a series of UN uh, discussions and um, real debates with very little uh, solution, very few solutions because of the UN Security Council uh, resolution. And I think as you see a structure, and I think uh, the challenge going forward is as the United States and China engage in perhaps a broader global competition, that challenge may become worse, not, not better. 
And so uh, I, I don't have any, I don't have great answers to that set of challenges other than to think through how we either figure out trying to solve some of these challenges with multilateral institutions that are outside of that purview or think about ways to to actually address that central challenge, which will be obviously very difficult to ever manage. Thank you, Nira. I agree with you that the results of the election of November the 3rd <laughs> will make an enormous difference for the future of the UN. Nevertheless, we need a plan B in case the elections go in the other direction. So, and I think we would need some ideas that could apply also in the case uh, Trump is re-elected. Amitav, do you have some ideas on how to reform the UN system? I do. Um, having sat through many of our previous sessions of this uh, group, uh, I have been thinking through this, and uh, here are a couple of uh, ideas that I have that I would like to put on the table. But first, um, just one quick point about my three C's, competition, uh, credibility, and confidence. I think one dimension of competition that I don't know whether it might uh, survive if uh, Joe Biden gets elected, whether it will survive or not, I'm not sure, but it might, is that there is a fear in the United States, uh, in the policy community, in the think tank community, and also, of course, in the Trump administration, uh, led by the Secretary of State, is that China is trying to take over uh, the multilateral system. And um, uh, like uh, China is putting its own people, including its own uh, citizens, but also its friends, and, and uh, that will lead to a Chinese takeover. Uh, now, this may be slightly exaggerated, but, uh, but this feeling is there if you read uh, some of the stories coming out on multilateralism and the UN uh, in, uh, in, from the United States. But uh, moving on to my specific ideas, um, very specifically, I think we need to create a Chapter 7 Committee on Pandemics. Uh, I have written about it in the most recently in an article in the Yale Global, but um, the Chapter 7 Committee will be similar to the UN Counterterrorism Committee. I mean, this uh, pandemic is going to kill more people, has killed more people than terrorism or, or most wars. And, uh, and uh, so the UN created, after 2003, a uh, Counterterrorism Committee, which actually had enforcement, kind of limited, but uh, an implied enforcement power for, uh, on reporting, compliance, monitoring, and also um, expecting states to allow international inspections when there is an outbreak of pandemic. Now, the UN Security Council on 1st of July adopted a resolution called 2523, which declared COVID-19 as an inter a threat to international peace and security. Actually, it didn't use the term threat. It said could endanger um, international peace and security. But still, the UN Security Council does have a mandate. But for many international law experts, that was not enforceable or binding because it was not. It was a recommendation and not a decision of the uh, UN Security Council. I don't want to split legal hairs here, but uh, it is certainly nothing similar to the UN Security Council resolution 2000 uh, after the 9/11, which actually made terrorist financing and uh, uh, support for terrorism as kind of a legally or uh, uh, yeah, uh, kind of uh, offenses or uh, uh, actions that could be the UN Security Council have to deal with this uh, under Chapter 7. <clears throat> so I think that will be very important. And another uh, idea that uh, I guess we have discussed before in this uh, uh, group is the creation of a bunch of uh, emergency councils. Now, you can have one emergency council, we have a security council, but as I said, the security council's performance has not been really fantastic, uh, in my view. Uh, and the emergency councils could actually be issue specific. They don't have to uh, include uh, all the uh, P5 and all the times in every issue area. It will depend on the interest and capacity of member states and, uh, and depending on issue area. Uh, but uh, they must have a mandate to meet and discuss and lead in certain issue areas, whether it's climate change or pandemic or terrorism or other uh, other issue areas. So, so those are a couple of ideas. I mean, I know we can talk um, about the UN Security Council reform, expansion until the cows come home. But, uh, but I think in the immediately to restore uh, confidence and credibility, we do need to have a Chapter Seven uh, kind of a uh, committee from the UN Security Council and the UN. Thank you. Thank you, Amita. Very clear, very clear message. Well taken on board, Monica. You have some suggestions on how to reform the UN. 
Well, I'm not sure there are very concrete suggestions, but they are very concrete concerns. Um, and uh, I would say that one frustration, uh, clear frustration regarding the UN system in these last 75 years has been the concrete um, results, the concrete possibilities of really making a difference for the developing world. Uh, of course, and we know, the importance and the contamination uh, and, of course, the role of the UN Security Council um, either addressing or not addressing specific uh, topics and issues and situations and realities and how much, uh, in fact, the economic social dimension of uh, international relations, of the differences and the inequalities in uh, the world system have, if not left, been left behind, at least been left as many times as a second, third or fourth priority. How to change that? Uh, how to make the UN system uh, really compromise with promoting change? Of course, we have the sustainable goals and we have had different moments of expectation regarding them. The, and but in fact we know the limitations and the fact and the the normalization of uh the issues addressed by them in the everyday life of un bureaucracy so as i said in the beginning i do not have the solution but i see that if this is not if this is not changed in the near future the question of, credi of the un credibility will become even worse and again, I think the pandemic and the evidence that the pandemic has really put on the table, and, and Professor Stiglitz mentioned it before, regarding the question of inequality, and the question of inequality not only in the developing world, is an opportunity to review and to revisit uh, the deficit and the depth, I say. I say that I would say that the UN system has with the developing world till today. Thank you, Monica. Now we only have uh, five minutes, no, six uh, minutes left before the deadline, which we were given of 6.15. And in this very short time available, we should deal with the last questions that I wanted to address you, which is the role of the regional organizations. So we know that regional organizations are very different in their nature, their competences, internal governance, and so on and so forth. But all together, they may and probably they should play a role in reshaping world order. My question is, how do you see the role of regional organization in this context? Nira, I will start with you again. Great. Um, so I'll be very brief. I, I, I think that regional relationships are, are really vital. And when we look back at the U.S., Europe relationship that has really taken place, I'd say primarily through a US, you know, through a NATO umbrella. And um, as I've said, I think there is a, uh, a deeper understanding of the importance of the US Europe relationship in the Trump era, where he has been so negative towards additional allies like Germany uh, specifically. So I think a, a new administration can really revitalize that, and I, I, I do think uh, I do want to say that these that these um, regional relationships are actually are obviously formed by or uh, helped along by forms of government that we have, and uh, I I do want to reiterate that I think it is vital for democracies themselves to. Um, think through how they can can work more multilaterally across the globe in concert to solve global challenges, not to the exclusion of uh, uh, of multilateral institutions that solve global challenges involving everyone. Obviously, the United States and China in, in the past have had great cooperation on the issue of climate, and that would be an area that we need renewed engagement. But I I. I worry that we do not think sufficiently about how democracies can work in concert because I do think autocratic regimes often, not always, but often think about how they can work in concert uh, to undermine democracy. Thank you. 
Amitav, based in, on your experience and knowledge in particular of ASEAN, how would you see uh, a contribution by regional organization to the to the to a new multilateral better functioning multilateralism thank you as uh, my european friends know i have been a scholar and champion of regionalism of most of my professional life and um, but uh, before i talk about what regional organizations can do let me just talk a bit about how the world order is going to change and uh, where regionalization might go. So there is a fair chance that uh, uh, the fragmentation of world order and especially due to COVID-19 could lead to more regionalization in global, global economy, uh, in security, and also in areas like health. So we already see that the global supply chains are under pressure even before the pandemic. But now, uh, you know, uh, we see uh, in companies in Wall Street are gearing up for regional uh, regionalization of supply chains. There is a very interesting report by Morgan Stanley, which uses the term regional champions, how certain sectors will become more regionalized in terms of their supply chains. And uh, we also see that um, that is the regionalization of health. Uh, so here you see the European Union, uh, of course, uh, has led the way. Uh, a very comprehensive uh, regional uh, approach to the COVID-19, while non-European states um, are also, um, you know, trying to struggle. European Union has come up with, a, I think, a very credible plan uh, to manage uh, the COVID-19, both economically but health-wise in the short and long term. ASEAN is doing the same thing, probably doesn't have as much resources as the European Union, but I would think that uh, uh, regionalization of health uh, and uh, also because of travel bubbles, the countries which are, see each other as uh, relatively safe from the virus will build up links, uh, travel links, open up borders. This is going to happen in, uh, let's say, between Australia and New Zealand, a bit in Southeast Asia, it will probably ha it's happening in Europe. So uh, in, uh, maybe in the you know, near term uh, between the US and Canada. And then we have regionalism security. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, countries like China uh, which are already trying to build some kind of regional uh, influence, uh, Russia, they might also have uh, security regions uh, taking advantage of the uh, pan um, COVID pandemic. So the fear is that this kind of regionalization may not be very good for world order. They can lead to fragmentation and competition between regions. So to address this, here is my proposal, which is that the UN, UN should create a council of regions. A council of regions will bring in the heads of all the regional organizations and, uh, um, and, and, and coordinate and talk to each other, see what every region is doing. Some of that already happens, but I think this will have to be formalized in conjunction with in coordination with the UN Security Council. So there is an immediate need uh, to me for a council of, of our regions, uh, our regional organizations. Uh, to, to, to make sure that uh, the fragmentation we see in the multilateral system doesn't become lead to sort of regional spheres of influence and, uh, and uh, kind of uh, further undermines global cooperation. Thank you, Amitabh. Monica, I will ask you to be very brief because uh, Joseph Borrell is already with us and I think he has very okay. little time. Okay, on... okay. Okay, Short I'll remark. be uh, as brief. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, well, okay. I just want to say that probably Latin America is the region with the most problematic scenario regarding regional institutionalization, regarding intra-regional political consensus, and regarding the disray, uh, its contribution to the disray of the multilateral system. Um, the fact that we, in a, an unfortunate way, now face the combination of an expansion of a very ideologized inter-Americanism construct with an obliterated multilateral regional setting. And this has become very problematic for our region. And definitely, I agree with uh, Amitav's uh, suggestion of, of building up uh, a territory for inter-regional coordination. But I think it would be important to include there the possibilities of issue-oriented coordination. No, but I, I was going to close the session because I think that uh, more or less we, we have discussed what we had the intention to discuss. The time available is already over. Jose Borrell is ready to intervene, so I only conclude by thanking all the speakers. Thank you very much for your contributions.
Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. It was not easy, but <laughs> hello, uh, Josep Borel. We have today the privilege and the pleasure of benefiting uh, for a few minutes, given his very charged agenda, of the extraordinary input of the High Representative for the European Union Foreign Policy, Josep Borel. Not only is Borrell the best person for deepening the guidelines of a progressive European Union contribution to the reform of the existing multilateral system, but also what is quite rare for bridging between the world of scientific research and the, the concrete policy action. Not everybody knows that Josep Borrell's background combines a political career notably as president of the European Union Parliament, Spanish foreign minister, with an outstanding position as professor of economics at the Madrid Complutense, and Borrell has also been president of the European University Institute. This background is very relevant, very relevant because what we firstly need is more and globally shared, as Stiglitz said, globally shared knowledge of an uncertain and quickly changing world. Maria Rodriguez already mentioned our contribution, our forthcoming book, Reforming Multilateralism in a Post-Covid Times, for a more regionalized, binding, legitimate United Nations, a book kindly endorsed by Josep Borrell, as the outcome of a global group of outstanding senior scholars issued of four continents, notably from Europe, China, Africa, India, Russia, the Americas, meeting online between February and July 2020, a dialogue promoted by the main progressive institute in Europe. It also took uh, stock, this, this uh, innovative work, of several decades of research conducted by one of the most relevant research and doctoral worldwide network funded by the European Commission, DG Research and coordinated by EA ULB with the acronym GEM, Globalization Europe and Multilateralism. We thank all the contributors to this work. Well, Mr. Borrell, our collective book starts with a lucid analysis, continued with the status quo, consisting of the declining multilateral governance is no longer an option, notably for progressive forces. However, the big problem is that the dramatic legitimacy and efficiency deficit already mentioned cannot be addressed by treaty change. Given the radical divergences among the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, in spite of this apparent deadlock, the European Union is expected by many states and regions to square the circle by playing a driving role for United Nations policies and governance reform. With which ideas, through which ideas, concrete proposal is the European Union taking this leading initiative? You certainly agree that we need a realistic reform avoiding both simple managerial adjustments and useless dreaming about utopias. You are the right leader combining realism with idealism. Awareness of the current power relation within the United Nations Security Council with political will of innovation by the European Union. We propose you three main research outcomes and three main questions. They are on a concrete dimension of power that is on governance, on how to decide and implement policies. First, the first historical change we must cope with is the global leadership vacuum. In a global context where the United States is neither willing nor able to play its early and traditional hegemonic role, and the economic giant China is openly discrediting it's a soft power. The European Union has its cards to play, particularly after the July 21st European Council historical decision to make further step toward integration. How could this revived European Union be more assertive in proposing its solution for a new collective, collective 
leadership of global governance, how to cope with the deadlock of the United Nations Security Council, shown, among others, by the April meeting failure on COVID-19 and the disappointing performances of the G20. Second, according to many book authors, part of the answer could also, could also come from a second historical change underlined by our research. When comparing with the United Nations Foundation 45, nobody can ignore the emergence, consolidation and the resilience of democratic and multilateral regional organization like European Union, Asian, African Union, CARICOM, Mercosur and others mentioned by Nelly Ferroci. How could these new economic and political actors be relevant from the point of view of your call for a new language of power? More precisely, is the most successful and sophisticated example of regional cooperation and integration in the world, that is the European Union, interested in enhancing the political role of a regional organization within the United Nations? Acharya mentioned this perspective. We have already proved as they, the, the regional organization, have already proved as very relevant through preventing and managing conflicts, balancing power politics of great states, containing nationalistic fragmentation, limiting the efficiency and legitimacy gap of United Nations governance. In the context of United Nations reform, could regional decentralization balance the needed process of centralization of the security pillar already started by General Secretary Antonio Guterres and the urgent need of strengthening the World Health Organization. Our book provides concrete proposal both for the necessary scrutiny of the two various regional organizations ready for a permanent dialogue with the UN as well as for their invitation to the United Nations Security Council or, as Acharya said, by a new Council of Regions. Thirdly and finally, the present multilateral governance is showing a dramatic implementation gap as well as a serious deficit in coordination among agencies. As Acharya said, this affects the credibility and also the Millennium Development Goals the United Nations credibility and legitimacy beyond any arrogant Eurocentrism. How could the European Union suggest the new ways for a more coordinated and binding governance? What is at stake is a supranational governance, you understand, versus the nationalist understanding of sovereignty, is an issue of power. First of all, could the ECOSOC currently a sleeping beauty, play the role of horizontal coordination between the United Nations system on the one hand and on the other hand the other multilateral organizations, WHO, IMF, World Bank, WTO. Secondly, regarding the binding side, which are the European Union proposal for a more binding global governance? Our research looks at the innovative and realistic ways shown, for example, by both the COP21 review system after the Paris arrangement and to the strict monitoring of the follow-up of policies implemented by some of the European Union directorate and agencies in the perspective also of the open method of coordination. So I summarized three facts and three questions. They are essential for the European Union contribution to reforming multilateral governance. I conclude, dear Joseph, I'm confident you can answer these 1 billion euros questions within the scheduled 10 minutes. Hope is life. You are responsible for the whole array of external relations of the 27 member states. European Union, so you are you are familiar with impossible missions. Thank you, Professor Tello. Thank you, Caro Mario. In fact, 
to answer all these questions is an impossible mission. <laughs> you pretend to me to give an answer in 10 minutes to all these array of issues that you are presented here and in your book. It's an impossible mission, but I will try to do my best. I'm very happy to be here with all of you on the eve of this uh, United Nations General Assembly. Congratulations for your book. Let's try to answer in quite a telegraphic and a structured way, if I can. First, uh, why multilateralism is still an answer to the problems that require us collective action? Uh, second, why it is in on crisis? Well, it has always been in crisis, but uh, today is a maybe a different crisis, and it's not just uh, the responsibility of the action of Mr. Trump. There is something more than that. Now, third and foremost, uh, which is from the European point of view, the thing that we have to do, as you were, were questioning, to renew these multilateralism, since we cannot longer continue doing things that were imagined 20 years ago. Well, m the world uh, has presenting enormous challenges to all of us. The role of Europe in the world has changed. Other countries share the most important part of the world economy. Interdependency brings a sense of vulnerability, but also immense opportunities. There are war and aggression at our borders, and our democratic rules and orders are being challenged. But in spite of this, all that, I don't think the world we live is in a more threatening situations, or the relations more complex than in the past. Remember the times of MAD, hmm? insured, um, mutually insured destruction. But things are completely different. And in spite of being different, the role of multilateralism is still the same, to level playing field between the states, regardless of their position in the international system. The most important interest of the multilateralism is to set up stable norms and standards applicable to all actors. And secondly, multilateralism is needed to guarantee protection of global public goods against the risk of pure market-driven or national approach. And the coronavirus is a good occasion to test international solidarity and the capacity to act in a multilateral way. And we Europeans, we have done a lot from the point of view of avoiding the vaccine nationalism and to consider the vaccine as a public good that can only be provided from a multilateral approach. Second, you were questioning which are the structural causes of the, this crisis? Well, clearly, one is the emergence of a multipolar world, more and more players, and less and less consensus among them. This is what is called multipolarity without multilateralism. Many players, less consensus, several actors willing to be hegemonic. Naturally, they tend to disagree, and they have the temptation to get free of the multilateral disciplines and look for bilateral deals in which they have more leverage. And that's why the, the US is leaving multilateralism approach and trying to do alone, one by one, because then its power is bigger. This deep crisis is reflected in many ways. Blocking of multilateral decisions in very important fora, Unilateral withdrawal from institutions and agreements, Americans from the Paris Accord, the GCPOA, the Open Skies Agreements, the World Health Organization, the last one. Third, refusing to accept international arbitration, China in the South China Sea or Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean. Four, practicing selective multilateralism, China, China defends the WTO, but in human rights, it seeks on the contrary to change the body of language of United Nations institutions. And fifth, to go to bilateralism what is, uh, what is good for them. China and American trade agreement poses a problem for Europeans because it excludes us from the benefits of the agreement. 
is the second structural source of retreat from multilateralism is the coming back of empires, the return of the political sovereignism advocated by a growing number of states, United States, but also China, Russia, and Turkey. They want to revise the multilateral system in one way or another, but retreating from the liberal vision of the world developed after the Second World War. This is the expression of the populism, and it's clear that all populist leaders are anti-multilateralists. And the third structural factor is the increasing complexity of problems, making universal solution more difficult, even illusory. It's no longer possible to negotiate among 140 states on complex issues to try to get agreement unanimity. I think this is one of the lessons, lessons of the failure of the Doha round. Uh, on this frame, which is the European answer? Well, we Europeans, well, the European Union more than Europeans, we are a multilateral by essence. We are naturally favorable to multilateralism. We are multilateral by essence. And we have always considered multilateralism as a way of tempering power politics. In fact, the European Union was based on the refusal of the very idea of power. And our contribution, paying financial contribution to a multilateral system is considerable. Maybe we punch below our waist, but in terms of multilateral engagement, we finance above our might. In my opinion, we Europeans, we need to work at three levels of action. First, we have to continue with the affirmation of universal principles and rules. We must continue defending in the face of the rise of cultural, of uh, we can say political relativism. It is obvious that there is today an attempt by a good number of countries to reestablish a relativism of rights on the the excuse of respect for diversity. That's why we need to invest politically in all fora related with human rights, including when these rights are challenged through new technologies. And you mean, you know what I am talking about. The second level of European action must be, in my opinion, to be putting together like-minded states those who share common interests and preferences on the way to organize the international system. But we cannot bring together everyone for everything. So we have to start bringing together those who, on the strategic level, are today worried about the Chino american rivalry and the risk that it poses for the third countries and especially for us. I think it is important that we join forces and formulate common proposals in all sectors where there is not a solid multilateral agreement. Artificial intelligence, cyber, disinformation, internet data. In all these areas of the future, where it can be cyber, artificial intelligence, intelligence, there is a regula regulatory, regulatory vacuum. To say that, there is a vacuum. And this vacuum has to be filled. Otherwise, everyone will defend its narrow interest imposing its standards. Let's take an example, the example of data. There are three competing visions in the world today. An American vision that is basically in favor of regulation by the market. So it will push for international regulation be as light as possible. Let the market do it. A Chinese vision that wants regulation by the state. And China will push for global regulation where everyone remains in control at home. And we know how dangerous it can be. And finally, an European vision that wants data protected from the benefit of citizens in Europe and around the world. And this brings to a battle of standards, which has only just begun. And I think multilateralism is a good instrument to protect our humanistic and liberal vision. And we Europeans, we have been norm setters because we have been 
technological leaders. If we lose the leadership of technology, we will not be able to continue being the norm setters. Finally, the third level of action to rehabilitate multilateralism consists in organizing global regulation subject by subject. In all relevant issues, it's necessary to create ad hoc coalitions on a basis that maybe will not be multilateral, but plurilateral. It is the case today on the framework of the World Trade Organization. And it's clear that these new modalities of multilateralism presuppose political commitment and good faith, which is not always the case. We Europeans we have to work in two tracks. We have to, to develop our leadership, developing new partnerships, and at the same time, to increase our strategic autonomy. To project the most effective role in the world, we need to promote multilateralism, but at the same time, to strengthen our strategic autonomy. These are two sides of the same coin. We have to be in a cooperative approach, the best guarantee for a peaceful and safe future for all, but at the same time, we have to assess a clear understanding of which are our interests, which not always coincide with the US interest. We share with them the same political system, the same economic system, but on the big confrontation that is coming between US and China, we have to look for our own way. This is a Franco-German initiative, Alliance for Multilateralism. It's an important step in the right direction, but I feel committed to continue working on that, and by the end of the year, or next spring, I hope we will be able to present a communication about uh, how the European Union can strengthen the multilateral system and to deliver more for the people who need it most. If it is not the case, multilateralism will lose legitimacy because unilateralism and power politics will win the game. We have always been a major driving force for multilateralism but now we must pursue this objective with a greater sense of urgency, with a greater unity, and with a greater ambition. I am sure that uh, for this communication, for this endeavor, your book and your work will be of most help. Thank you, Mario. Thank you to all of you. Okay, we move over to, to the next panel, and there is always a good and a bad news. Well, the good news is I do not need to promote any publication, but the bad news is unfortunately for health reasons, we have lost one of our speakers in the panel, Lim Guan Eng, who is the former Minister of Finance uh, from Malaysia, and who is also the Secretary General of our sister party, the Democratic Action Party of Malaysia. But we have an exciting panel because it's a global panel, we have Europe, we have Africa, we have Latin America, and we have Asia. So to cut a long story short, I will just give uh, as introduction one reflection, which may surprise you. Today is the 50th anniversary of the death of Jimi Hendrix. And so I come from rock and roll. And Jimi Hendrix, one of the famous songs of him is At the Crossroads. And I think this is really a good, what we call leitmotiv in German, 
we are at the crossroads. We are at the crossroads between power politics and multilateralism. We are at the crossroads between war and peace again. We are at the crossroads between democracy and new fascism. And this is not only a European and African, Asian or Latin American issue, it's a global issue. And therefore, platforms like the one that I have the pleasure to coordinate, the, glo the Global Alliance, the Global Progressive Alliance, is really is a tool where progressives meet together and give together a, com a definition of politics. So it's my pleasure now to invite the president of the Party of European Socialists, Sergei Stanishev, whom we already met uh, virtually some hours ago in the board meeting of Progressive Alliance, to give his statement because when we say what can be now, how to shape better, fairer and more inclusive uh, multilateralism, how can we break it down into a, a common agenda? And uh, well, Europe is one uh, example in particular now in times of corona crisis where still multilateralism can function and can work if it's under leadership of the progressives. So, Sergei, please give us your point of view on this. <clears throat> Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks, Connie, for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank FEPS and all its partners for organizing such an interesting and high-level uh, conference on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. And uh, let me just say at the beginning that 75 years is a long time. If you look at the outcome of the work of this organization, I think it was pretty successful because the, from the very beginning, it was created to prevent the world from another world war, the global conflict. And this major task was delivered. But of course, it was constructed, it was tailored for a world which was bipolar. There were two major superpowers fighting and they were balancing each other. Now we live in a different world. After the falling apart of the Soviet Union, uh, came the time for the unipolar in a way world with America dominating and leading. But we move now to another phase where the United States are putting their national selfish interests at the first place, and they withdraw from global leadership, which puts uh, additional stress on the international system and multilateralism, uh, including the European Union, of course. And we must say that the United Nations system needs a reform, of course. We strongly support as uh, social democrats and progressives the agenda of Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, which can give new meaning and new tools the United Nations to develop as the core of the system of modern multilateralism. And why we are, in the end, multilateralists? Because uh, this is the most fair system to prevent wars, to develop sustainable, de sustainable development, and uh, to guarantee that the world will be more just we as socialists and the social democrats are in the first place also internationalists because we know that the problems are not between the nations in the end but uh, they are the problems created by the modern uh, neoliberal philosophy which was dominating in the last 30 years and which created all the disbalances and injustices of modern uh, globalization which led as a consequence, to the growing nationalism. Because uh, the populists and nationalists, they are creating, of course, a fake alternative. But it is very simple in explanation, and it creates uh, the fake sense of security to the citizens, because they promise them that they will be brought back to the golden past, which, by the way, never existed. And they will be protected by uh, the insecurities of the modern world, by a strong nationalist state. Now, our understanding is completely different. We are facing uh, global challenges, and no one can be safe, isolated, and created, creating wall, walls around their country. Look at uh, climate change. Look at COVID-19 crisis. Not a single nation can be protected on its own. We need to find global solutions. And if you look at the priorities, politically, from the point of view of the substance of policies, for me, sustainable development goals is the number one priority for which all progressives around the world should unite and press for. 
because in its essence, uh, these are social democratic policies. They are for fairer societies. They are for more just international order. They are pro for protection of the nature and more rational use of the natural, na uh, natural resources. And at the same time, I think the essential element is that they, have, they are the tool to fight inequality because they put in their core a number of policies which are vital for equalities, like accessible health care and quality health care, like education, which can provide the future generations with the tools to be competitive and tools to be at equal starting point in their lives. And this is essential. This is why I believe that we as a progressive should press strongly politically at every level to develop the sustainable development goals and to have a result in every country. But of course, we need a strong international alliance to achieve this. And uh, our allies are, of course, at the first place, all uh, left progressive social democratic parties around the world because we share the same values, but also civil societies because they proved in a number of issues, in a number of countries, that they're very vital and they can be the driving force for a positive, progressive, fair change. We should back them in a very powerful way. As a follow-up to what already was said by José Borrell, I think that the European Union uh, has a historical role to play in this moment of crossroads, of a way which, in which direction the world will develop. Because uh, we are seeing that uh, power policies, policies of uh, selfishness, national interest first, without looking at the balances, is destroying global stability. The European Union, however, is seen as a much fairer player in international relations. Um, because of its very essence, uniting 27 nations, a union and a force which can take into consideration the different viewpoints and the different interests of the country, but also with a very strong value core, a value core like democracy, human rights, social justice rights, all these elements which are so imminent and which made the European project the most successful project of the 20th century. This is the trademark of the European Union. And this puts potentially the Union in a strong position internationally. But we also need some uh, internal reforms in the Union if we want to be more successful internationally, to speak much more uh, with one single voice in uh, foreign in international relations. So I think these are not easy tasks, but we, uh, progressives, has always been facing in our history difficult tasks and challenges, but uh, the very idea of our movement is the idea of change. A change uh, which leads towards a world which is fairer, more just, more equal for every citizen. And this is, we should not underestimate it, a tremendous power which can energize societies, energize people, and help us achieve these goals. Much forget, yes, indeed, at the crossroads, and we have to invent and give a new meaning to multilateralism, and the SDGs is, uh, well, framing our agenda, and in particular, I think it's important what you said, that we need a strong alliance, a global alliance, a progressive alliance between progressive parties, between civil society, progressive civil society, and the trade union and workers' movement. It's a pleasure now to, well, I would have liked to give the floor to Martin Zingile, the former Prime Minister of the Central African <coughs> Republic. Unfortunately, for technical reasons, uh, digital uh, era yeah, it did not arrive on all continents in the same at the same level. He cannot be with us, so we have a short video statement from his side. So please bring in the video statement from Martin Zingele. Les forces progressistes dans le monde ont une très grande responsabilité dans les changements qu'il faudra apporter d'abord à la gouvernance mondiale à travers le système des Nations Unies. Je parle de la République centrafricaine, un pays situé au cœur de l'Afrique. Je n'ai pas la prétention de dire ce que tous les Africains pensent. Mais pour nous, le multilatéralisme, c'est d'abord de faire en sorte que le fossé 
le niveau de vie entre les populations qui vivent dans cette partie-là de l'humanité que ce fossé avec l'hémisphère nord soit réduit. Les Nations Unies, où le multilatéralisme est vécu comme cette possibilité d'améliorer sensiblement le niveau de vie des populations. Et aujourd'hui, avec la pandémie du sida, nous voyons bien que lorsqu'il y a un défi, il s'adresse à la totalité de l'humanité. Chacun meurt indistinctement de l'endroit où il vit. Mais lorsqu'il y a des richesses, dans la gestion et la gouvernance globale pour le partage de ces richesses-là, la différence s'instaure. Donc, qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire Il faut porter des réformes profondes au fonctionnement, par exemple des Nations Unies, pour une plus grande efficacité dans la gouvernance économique. Parce que ce qui fonde l'inégalité des relations entre les nations, entre les continents, entre l'hémisphère nord et l'hémisphère sud, entre le nord et le sud, à l'intérieur des pays, entre les classes sociales, c'est d'abord la, la, la propriété, l'économie. C'est la gestion des richesses qui est inégalitaire et tout le reste des constructions politiques, diplomatiques, sont faites pour protéger ces acquis-là. Donc la démocratisation, la simplification, la répartition égalitaire des richesses et les changements qui doivent être induits dans la gouvernance globale par rapport à la gestion de ces richesses-là est le combat permanent des progressistes. On dit que ventre affamé n'a pas d'oreille. Si la question économique, la question de répartition des richesses n'est pas réglée, comment peut-on parler des droits humains Comment peut-on parler d'une attitude de lutte collective contre le réchauffement climatique, contre les bouleversements climatiques et pour une plus grande amélioration de la vie de l'espèce humaine C'est pour ça qu'au cœur de la démarche du multilatéralisme, il y a la question de la gestion des ressources. Well, I would have liked to thank personally and at this stage Martin Zingele, but uh, well, we will send greetings of solidarity to him. He stands very much in the forefront of the fight against corruption and also the, the war crimes in this country. The next to take the floor is the next generation, I would say, is Joanna Ortega, the actual president of UZI. We have met several times in spite of the age difference on the, in different frames of progressives around the world. And you know, you, I know you, you are a committed uh, progressive uh, world future leader in my understanding. We are discussing multilateralism and indeed we speak on the situation now that we want to improve in the future and for the future. So in fact, it will be from your side, from the generation, but also from your side, from coming from uh, Ecuador, uh, from Paraguay, sorry, from Latin America. What would be your expectation of a new reformed and redeveloped multilateralism? Floor is yours for maximum <coughs> three to four minutes. Thank you, Connie. And it's good that you uh, didn't say Uruguay because the confusion is always Paraguay and Uruguay, not with Ecuador. But it's good. We are all, all Latin America. Okay, first of all, I think we need an urgent agreement for, from the democratic sector beyond political parties and ideologies because the national populism are the ones disarming the multilateral platforms right now. And as previous speakers say, I, I think also that United States and Trump are the major example of that. So we must promote multilateralism and regional integration as a process of the states and not as a particular issue of one sector or another. But at the almost obligatory consequences of the states in a world of financial, technological, and also economic globalization. Having said that, I am going to give a specific example from the region I come from, Latin America, because in the recent decades, regional platforms here have always responded to alliances of the right wing, such as the Pacific Alliance, for example, or the left wing, such as UNASUR, depending on the political moment that the region is experiencing. So they end up being temporary and unsustainable platforms. And we need to warranty these spaces with a strong democratic alliance here in Latin America, but also in other regions 
and all around the world. So I do think that uh, the, the most urgent task for us is to have this agreement from the democratic sector beyond political parties and ideologies. And of course, I think that we as young people have a lot to say about this topic. And um, of course, understanding that the decisions our government make today uh, at the national level, at the regional level, and also at the global level will affect the rest of our lives and the future generations that are coming. So I do not, do not want to forget to say that the multilateral space should not be exempt from an equal representation of gender, representation of diversities, race, sexual orientation, and of course, generational. If we think that the multilateralism that we need to promote as uh, progressives are not only in the government level, but also with the uh, a, a social, social and civil society, we must uh, think of this representation of diversities and uh, the only way, way to ensure truly democratic spaces with, is, with this diverse representation, including the diverse viewpoints of people from all around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joanna, for highlighting the diversity and don't be afraid. I know the difference between Paraguay and Uruguay, <laughs> but thank you for coming in at this stage. The next speaker is a good friend, uh, Howard Lee, and who was also engaged in the youth movement, but we know him also as International Secretary of the Democratic Action Party for Malaysia. And he also was in the recent time Minister in Regional Government in Malaysia, very well experienced. And it's important to have you from, well, we will not speak at this time particularly on Malaysia, but I have to mention at this stage that we had also invited Lim Guan Eng because he is awfully persecuted in his country and under very bad accusations. And as Progressive Alliance, we are organizing a solidarity campaign with him. But we may understand that for you, it's now one o'clock in the morning that not everybody can understand an 18 or 20 hours day. So thank you very much for, for coming in. So. The, partic the question, the particularity, or the particularity of my question to you is: Well, for Malaysia, you are in the situation you have China and the giant China as a neighbor, and the, the question of the relationship of multilateralism for sure is certainly another view than we have in Europe and that um, have in Latin America. Although there's a lot of Chinese investment also in Africa and Latin America, so what would be your point to make on the question of uh, new, fair, and inclusive multilateralism from the point of view from the region in which you are in Malaysia. Well, um, thank you, Connie. Uh, once again, paraphrasing Connie, paraphrasing, paraphrasing Jimi Hendrix. Um, today, uh, the world is indeed uh, at a set of crossroads and uh, we are uh, in Malaysia and many other countries are still facing one of the, the, the biggest uh, global threats in over a century, which is COVID-19. The world is talking about it. The world is still suffering from it. Um, as the virus ravages across the world, um, other long, deep-rooted problems have worsened. Um, those who are more vulnerable uh, suffer greater hardship, while others find themselves with newfound obstacles. Uh, I would paraphrase Guan Ying. Uh, he would say, the light has literally gone out of our lives. And governments uh, are fighting against time uh, and the pandemic with no precedence to refer to. There is literally no playbook for us to refer to. And whilst a few have foreseen such catastrophe and have issued warnings, um, no one was prepared for it. Uh, definitely Malaysia wasn't prepared for it. Uh, some nations were expedient at containing the spread, uh, others uh, were less so and are still suffering. And multilateral institutions like uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, did what they were capable of. Uh, but the healthcare, social and economic crises uh, that have unfolded is, is still wreaking havoc. And in Malaysia, uh, we fortunately managed to contain the healthcare crisis. Uh, but the social, economic and political fronts, um, these different fronts have their very own set of challenges uh, in the Malaysian context. Even before the pandemic, um, multilateralism has been the cornerstone for uh, Malaysian foreign policy. Uh, multilateralism is, is important, very important for a small state like Malaysia. Uh, as it stops us from uh, from being rendered powerless uh, on the international stage, 
dictated by bigger powers. And as you mentioned, the power play between uh, the United States and China. Um, and I think fundamentally the solution uh, would be a change of mindset where we see multilateralism uh, being a, a function or a vehicle to close the gap between nations. Um, the old world order is on the brink of collapse without a new one in the making. The United Nations have played an inst instrumental role in ensuring world's peace and progress since World War II, yet uh, it is now held ransom by great powers that fail to provide uh, global governance that we very sorely need right now. Uh, and even as we co uh, combat the pandemic, uh, the US has unilaterally pulled out of the World Health Organization, whom we need more than ever, while the UN Security Council fails to provide uh, the strong, the type of strong leadership in response to COVID-19 due to the differences between permanent members. How does that play out for a small state like Malaysia? And this is without even talking about other equally pressing issues uh, that are also hounding and continues to haunt us, such as climate change, uh, vaccine production, dissemination and distribution, uh, cybersecurity and governance, uh, post-pandemic economic and social recovery and other potential unraveling existential threats on humankind. Now, how are we going to close the gap between the capacity of developed nations and developing nations like Malaysia? And how do we ensure citizens of poorer nations wouldn't be worse off than those of richer Can ones you? on these global issues? Uh, I believe that a new progressive multi uh, multilateralism is indeed the only answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> At this stage, you say there's a necessity for a mind change. And uh, when we were speaking on the ambition for renewed multilateralism, perhaps the last round, the short answer where all of you would say, how can we as progressive get to this mind change? Sergey, we have. Well, I, I often like to. Question. Yes. Well, it's a matter of action because. Uh, the only way to change the world is to act, to make an effort, starting from small things and uh, le leading towards bigger things. And I often quote Antonio Gramsci, who was saying about, who was talking about pessimism of mind and the optimism of will. Our nature as social democrats, as progressives, is optimistic. We believe that the world can be changed. So we have to come together as a political force globally through the Progressive Alliance by all means which we have available and execute political action, pressing everyone at every level to come up with the reformed United Nations, which will lead to a fairer world because this is a mandatory need for the existence of humankind. And no one else but us can provide a policy which can protect both the planet and humans through sustainable development and socially just development. This is a very powerful force. If we believe in it, we can move the mountains, I believe. Thank you very much on this very positive note, a lot of energizing. Yes, we, we believe there is a need and there is also, we believe that we are able to do so. Johanna, on your shoulders, yeah, the next generation. This question of mind change, you work well in the global youth movement and many of you, your predecessors have become political leaders in the world around. We see the example of Jacinta Ardern, which gives an example, fantastic leadership in New Zealand. So where, how do you see this necessity of working also on the mindset? Okay, it, it must be said clearly, without multilateralism, we may be seeing a future of weak states and a world governed by corporations, which is a direct threat to the social rights that we as progressive promote. So, of course, this topic is part of our youth agenda. Uh, in addition, I must say that the pandemic shows that it is necessary to face these types of threats, health, environmental security, regionally and not uh, nationally. That's why I think that uh, we also need to, to discuss, when we discuss uh, multilateralism, uh, we should uh, discuss also how, how, how other, pro other problems will affect different regions. Here, for example, in Latin America, we 
when we discuss this, we also link it with drug trafficking, money laundering, and of course the climate crisis, for example, that uh, demand regional and global responses and that they are urgent issues and we cannot not waste more time. We must really, really act now. Thank you. Yes, we must act now and we have to act on all the continents. This is why we need a work on multilateralism on all continents. Finally, Howard, the last word I will not say because there are other speakers behind, but by respect for the other speakers, a short statement. Where would you say we should focus on now for the period to come and on the work on renewed multilateralism? Um, multilateralism must not only be the playbook of uh, rich and powerful governments, uh, but to serve all governments. And furthermore, real, progressive and inclusive multilateralism uh, needs also be one that embraces interconnectedness, uh, cooperation and partnerships among CSOs, NGOs, businesses, uh, rights advocates groups, uh, climate change organization, etc., etc., at a supranational uh, national level. Uh, we now live in a world and a generation that have experienced and suffered from a global threat of humankind uh, and the human economy that strikes silently but claims casualties uh, beyond any of our comprehension and in many respects the old is dying and the new cannot be born so a new multilateralism the future of multilateralism needs to be one that enables the strength of one to be multiplied in solidarity for the benefit of all and the threats and weaknesses of the one to be overcome together by all um, and I think this is fundamentally what we need to do for multilateralism and especially we need to empower progressive alliance, uh, multilateralism at the party level, but at the global level to uphold internationalism. Thank you. My apologies that we have to close here. We could continue certainly and we will have other opportunities, but thank you very much for insisting on the new meaning of multilateralism, on the question of necessity of diversity and also that is a matter of a mindset. And I think we need to, if it, it's not only that we work for voting social for social democrats and progressive, it's also that we have to work on the necessity to understand why it's a win-win situation if we have more multilateralism and that nationalism is a deadlock and nationalism like it's Francois Mitterrand said it very clearly, nationalism leads to war and nothing else. So let's close by this and I hand over to the next panel. Thank you very much, Sergei, Johanna and Howard. Well, thank you, Connie, and thank you to all the speakers uh, from the previous panel. This was indeed a fascinating debate and an important one, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the closing session. And to be honest, I'm a little bit reluctant to call it that, a closing section, because while we are approaching the end of our conference today, I very much hope that we are not approaching the end of this conversation. We are celebrating um, the 75th anniversary of the UN, this year, and it's my honor and my pleasure to invite Fabrizio Hochschild to share his thoughts with us today. Uh, Fabrizio is the uh, Under Secretary General, and he is the Special Advisor to the Secretary General for the commemoration of the United Nations anniversary. Um, I'm very pleased that he is with us today, but given his schedule, he can't be with us for a very long time, which is why I'm going to cut short my introductory remarks and just hand over the floor to you, Fabrizio. Thank you. We know that we are extremely busy with everything that's coming up next week, but please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this opportunity to join you. And it's, uh, I, I was listening in to this very rich debate and the debate that is absolutely critical at this time. We are, as you pointed out, marking our 75th anniversary uh, at the time of the largest pandemic uh, in a century. And the outlook for the world is to a certain extent as fraught with insecurity and uncertainty as it was when the UN was founded 75 years ago. Continued progress of the sort that we've seen pretty consistently over the past 75 years is far from certain with a growing inequality the threat of climate change, disruption from great demographic shifts, an accelerating digital revolution, the impact of which in dangerous ways is escaping our control for all the wonderful benefits it also brings. 
One would expect at times like this that countries would come together and work more closely in the spirit of the United Nations Charter. But disunity often prevails, and we are seeing a resurgence of great power politics and the all too frequent perception of a contradiction between national interests and multilateral solutions, which has led to some to retreat from the UN system. COVID-19 has laid these fault lines bare and in some cases exacerbate them. It's widened the divide between haves and have-nots, also in the digital domain. Recovering from COVID and rebuilding better is an enormous task that needs solidarity at the community, national, and most critically, international levels. And yet COVID-19 is paradoxically happening at the same time as many around the world speak of a crisis in multilateralism. This crisis, and we have to acknowledge this, is also due to a growing sense that multilateralism has not delivered or delivered ad adequately. And people see that in the failures of the Security Council to deal year after year with some of the most critical threats to international security. People see that in the failures of the member states at large to come to grips with climate change. So the big question of our time is how can we renew and reinvigorate these mechanisms established 75 years ago? How can they be reimagined for the next 25 years to better deal with current and emerging challenges? That, it was in that spirit and against that backdrop that the Secretary General decided that the UN 75 will not be marked with a big celebration, but rather we would use the opportunity to reach out and to listen to people across the world around four basic questions. What are your priorities for post-COVID recovery? What are your priorities for the world 25 years from now? What do you see as the biggest threats to the realization of that vision? And what are your expectations of international cooperation and of the UN in particular to better address any gap between your hopes and fears? We've had thousands of dialogues in dozens of countries. We've surveyed well over a million people in all 193 countries. And we've had in-depth independent surveys done by some very renowned international survey companies. The Secretary General will present the results at the UN General Assembly's official high-level meeting on Monday, which is the formal commemoration of the 75 years of the UN, under the banner, the future we need, the UN we want. Against, so I would like to share with you some of the key findings. Um, striking against the backdrop of polarization, friction, disagreement, and deadlock, that so often characterize member state deliberations here, we found that across regions, ages, and social groups, respondents to our listening exercise were remarkably united in their priorities for the future and in their fears. Amid the current COVID-19 crisis, the immediate priority for most respondents is improved access to basic services, to healthcare, to safe water and sanitation, and to education. But this is followed by calls for much greater international solidarity as a second priority and increased support to those hardest hit. And this includes calls for better tackling of inequality and rebuilding with a more inclusive economy. COVID's disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable has made people much more aware of growing inequalities in two out of three countries. Looking to the future, the overwhelming concerns of the climate crisis and the destruction of our national, natural environment. With the pandemic, fears have grown about the threat in future of other health threats. But that fear that one would imagine would overshadow the climate crisis has not done so. The climate crisis remains people's number one concern about the future. Other priorities include ensuring greater respect for human rights, settling conflicts, tackling poverty, and reducing corruption. With regard to perceptions of the UN, 
Close to 90% of respondents said that they believe global cooperation is vital to deal with today's challenges. 75 years after its founding, six in 10 respondents said they believe the UN has made the world a better place. But looking to the future, an even higher proportion, 74%, say the UN is absolutely essential to tackling challenges. And support to international cooperation and the UN in particular is particularly high among younger people and among, interestingly, more among women than among men. But, the U but people are not uncritical. Respondents want the UN to change. They want to see an innovated, reimagined multilateralism. They want the UN to become more inclusive of the diversity of actors in the 21st century and for it to grow more transparent, accountable and effective. Preliminary results from our work have already fed into the drafting process of the UN 75 Declaration, which will be adopted by heads of state on Monday, the 21st of September. Further, the report, which will be published in its final form on over the weekend, um, will be a, a preliminary report and the final report will come out at the end uh, of, of the year. And we will be gathering findings until the end uh, of the year. So the world is speaking, the world is expressing itself. We have listened and we will do our utmost to encourage governments to act on the basis of the voices we have gathered from all states everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrizio. Uh, thank you for not only sharing your thoughts, but also for sharing these insights from your research, which is great because it um, gives a much more positive and optimistic note than what one would often suspect. We know that you will have to leave us now, and I would like to thank you once again. Um, and all the best for next week. Thank you so um, much. We are co-hosting this event from New York City and Maria in her opening statements said that we should all imagine that we are in New York and so to facilitate this process of imagination I'm just going to share a little treat with you and I'm going to lift up my computer and I'm going to walk to the window to share a view of Manhattan and as you can see the city is still there and City had to change and the city had to adapt, but it's still there. And I very much hope that what holds true for New York City will also hold true for multilateralism in the long term. Sergei mentioned in the last panel that it's a matter of action, that multilateralism needs action. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you, um, the German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas, who has um, just about one year ago launched a fascinating initiative, which is called the Alliance for Multilateralism. And um, people in the German Foreign Ministry have been um, positively surprised by the feedback that they've received on, on this initiative. It's been a real success story, as far as we can tell. And um, I think that um, Heiko is going to mention and to, to discuss this uh, initiative in his statement, and I'm very happy to invite you to listen to this pre-recorded statement by Foreign Minister Heiko Maas right now. Thank you, colleagues and friends, for this opportunity to share some thoughts with you today on the eve of the 75th United Nations General Assembly. This is not just an historic anniversary. We are living at a crucial moment for multilateralism. The entire world faces the same challenge, the COVID-19 pandemic and its massive effects on our societies and economies. In his most recent book, the famous political scientist Ivan Krastev says, it remains unclear in which direction these changes will take us. And he's right. But one thing is already clear. 
those who work together, those who follow scientific advice, and those who stick to rules and reason are getting through this crisis much better than others. Dear friends, this proves what we as progressives knew all along. In an interconnected world, multilateral cooperation is the foundation of peace, prosperity, equality and justice. Simply because none of the major challenges of our times, pandemics, climate change, migration and the digital transformation can be tackled by one country alone. Some important actors, however, feel less and less attached to multilateralism and the underlying idea of give and take. Just think of the many Russian and Chinese vetoes in the Security Council on Syria or of the American policy regarding the WHO or the Paris Agreement. This situation leaves us Germans, Europeans, progressives worldwide with only one choice, to invest even more in multilateral order, to defend it when it is being attacked and to reform it when necessary. Dear friends, the idea of multilateralism which took shape 75 years ago is more relevant today than ever. But we need new approaches, for instance on rules and responsibilities in the digital world. We need new partners like civil society, local governments, the private sector and scientists. And we need new formats that bring of these actors together on issues where cooperation is still lacking. That is the idea behind the Alliance for Multilateralism, which I founded together with a handful of like-minded foreign ministers two years ago. Since then, over 60 countries have contributed. Our initiatives range from disarmament to addressing disinformation campaigns. And we have reached out to NGOs, civil society, private companies and cities because we need their input and their transformative ideas for our work. The pandemic has made this perfectly clear. There's one more thing that the pandemic has demonstrated. The future of multilateralism depends on the strength and the unity of the European Union and allies around the globe. It was the European Union together with the civil society that set up the ACT Accelerator, which funds the global development of COVID tests and vaccines. And we have launched a global response which has raised almost 16 billion euros so far for universal access to tests, treatments and vaccines. Dear friends, these are the results of multilateral cooperation, results that benefit men and women around the world. This gives me hope that we can turn the current crisis into an opportunity to build better back. It may be too early to say anything about the long-term effects of the crisis, but it is not too early to work together for the best possible outcome. Just like you are doing here today. And it is good to know that we are in this together. Thank you for your support. I would like to renew my thanks to all of the many, many participants who have joined the debate from around the world. I feel that in many ways, this conference was almost like a session of the United Nations General Assembly en miniature with participants and contributors from five continents and from dozens of countries and I would like to take the opportunity to thank all of you all of you for this participation in this event and as I said before I very much hope that this is the beginning of an important debate and not the end of it